guys, I want to use Father's Day as an opportunity to launch a new sermon series entitled Dysfunctional. <laughs> and uh, uh, I thought, well, that's a great way to start Father's Day. But anyway, it's basically uh, dysfunctional old stories with the same old problems. What we're going to do is we're going to look at some old stories from the Old Testament that you guys are probably familiar with. Maybe you're not. And what you'll discover, hopefully what we'll discover is that the same problems that they dealt with back then are the same problems we deal with today in 2024. And we want to start this series by looking at some, uh, uh, really one of the most popular men in the entire Bible. In fact, if I were to take a poll and ask you to write down the five greatest men in the Bible, I'm sure that we would have some common answers. I pray at the top of everybody's list would be Jesus. Amen. If he's not at the top of your list, then see me after church. We need to talk, okay? But then there, we'd also have some other common answers, people like men like Abraham and Moses and Daniel. And I think on many people's list would be the name of David. If you read your Bible for any length of time, been in church for any length of time at all, then you know that there are a few men that can compare or compete with Israel's greatest king. There honestly really is nobody like David. In fact, David is defined by God this way in Acts 13, 22. After removing Saul, he made David their king. Listen to this. And God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. It's probably the greatest compliment anybody could ever get for God to be able to say that about you. And then God says this about him. He will do everything I want him to do. If you don't know who David is, David is the one that brings victory over Goliath. As a young teenager, David will lead Israel later on to defeat the Philistines. David will recover the Ark of the Covenant and, and bring it back to Jerusalem. David will be the one that will lay out the vision for the, um, for the temple that will be built by his son Solomon. David was so creative that he wrote 73 of the book of Psalms in in Psalms, and of those 73 Psalms, many of them have been turned into songs. It was David who wrote the words to this song, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises will continually be on my lips. It was David who said, bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me, bless his holy name. What are you saying, Travis? I'm saying God, or David knew how to bless God, and David knew how to worship God. In fact, there's really nobody, nobody quite like David. Even to this day, the star on the flag of Israel is called the Star of David. Jerusalem is called the holy city of David. There's no one that compares to David. But for all of David's achievements and accomplishments, for all of his work and his powerful times of worship, the one thing you discover about David is that his family and that his life and that his marriages were completely dysfunctional. In fact, if you were to categorize David's Life, it certainly wouldn't, certainly wouldn't fall into that category of fairy tale. In fact, if you were to categorize his life, you would probably put it somewhere between soap opera and Jerry Springer. Because that's really where it belongs. And what you end up learning about David and discover about David is that, is that David needed a lot of grace. Just like you and just like me. Let me ask you a question. If the walls of your house could speak, what kind of story would they tell? Would they tell a story of laughter and joy and peace? Or would it be a story of constant conflict and hurtful words? Maybe you grew up in a home and mom and dad were constantly fighting back and forth. And as a, as a young person, you were observing all that. You were a spectator to it. And you, you told yourself, when I get my home, when I get married, that will never happen in my home. And it's happened. And it's, and it's part of the home you live in. If the walls of your house could speak, what kind of story would they tell? Would they tell a story of courageous commitment? Or would they tell a story of broken promises? You know, we stand before God on our wedding days, before friends and family that have all gathered there. We make promises of love and devotion each to the other. And we make these vows that basically say for Better or for worse, for rich or for poor, in sickness and in health, to be true in you and you only. And I've officiated a lot of weddings. I don't know any wedding ceremony that I've officiated where the husband or, or the wife or the groom or the bride doesn't mean that in that moment. They, they mean what they say. But then something unexpected happens. You didn't know that your husband would lose his job and money would be tight. You didn't know that she was going to be battling depression the way that she does. You didn't know it was going to be this difficult raising kids. Can I get an amen? 
You didn't know there would, that you would have this unexpected attraction to a, to a coworker. You didn't know that they would get sick. You didn't know that your husband would have this, this passive, unengaged attitude about life and about marriage. You didn't know. Fill in the blank. It's your life, it's your marriage, it's your relationships. Just, just fill in the blank. My guess is if you were to ask David, he never would imagine that his life and his marriage would have ended up the way that it did. Let me give you a little bit of context for, for David's life so you can understand what I'm talking about. The Bible says this about David in the spring when the kings were off at war. But that year, David decided not to go to war. He should have been at war with his men, but for one reason or another, he doesn't go. He stays at home in the palace, and his army is away, and, and he's in the palace late one night, and he can't sleep. He decides to go up on the, the top of the palace roof to get some fresh air. That's what he tells himself. But David knows what he's going to see. It's the right time of the night, and from that perspective, from the palace roof, he could see all the other rooftops, and he knew what he was going to see. He knew that he would see women bathing. And so, he's restless one night. He can't sleep, so he picks up his phone. He turns on the TV, and he knows what he's going to see. And he sees Bathsheba, and she's, and she's beautiful. And he's entranced with her, and he, he thinks he's got to have her. And he asks the servant that's with him, and who is that? And his servant responds, knowing who it is, and he's trying to protect David here, and he says, mm, David, that's Bathsheba, that's, that's the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. You remember Uriah, you, used, you fought with him and, and now he's fighting for you right now. That's his wife, Bathsheba. David doesn't listen to the warning at all from his servant and he says, go get her. And I've heard some people say, well, Bathsheba had a choice whether or not to go. No, she didn't. When you are called in that culture, in that time, in that season of history, when the king and the most powerful man in the world calls you, you go. Bathsheba goes into his room and, and David rapes her. She's not there because she wants to be there. She's there because she's forced to be there. David carries on this affair with her. She becomes pregnant and to cover it up and keep it a secret, he calls Uriah back from the battlefield thinking that if I can get Uriah to sleep with his wife and go to bed, then Uriah will think and everybody else will think, well, this is Uriah's baby. That's what happened. But there's a problem with this plan because Uriah refuses to sleep in his own bed. He refuses to sleep with his wife. He's not going to do that when he's got brothers at arms who are bleeding on the battlefield. He says, I honor them too much to do that. And he sleeps on the front porch of his house. David doesn't know what to do. Can I ask y'all a question? What is David doing right here? What's he doing? He's doing the same thing you and I do. He's trying to hide his sin. He's trying to cover it up, push it under the rug. He's trying to, he's trying to, 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 just, to just make it go away somehow, just, just get rid of it. And he's, trying to, he's trying to act like everything is okay, put on this illusion like everything is fine when it's not fine. Can I tell you all something? I'm just going to be very real. Everybody here on Father's Day looks great. You guys have great smiles. You smell good. You look good. I, you know, you guys all look fantastic with your pretty clothes and all that. Just fantastic. But can I tell you, there's not one person in this building that has a perfect life or a perfect marriage. Nobody lives that Facebook, Instagram, where everything is ideal and perfect all the time life. That is all just show. It's just not real. Everybody here has issues. Everybody here has problems. And David, you know what he does? He decides to take it up a notch. And he sends Uriah back into the battlefield with a sealed letter to give to the commanding officer. And Uriah takes this letter without even knowing he is carrying with him the death warrant on his life. And he hands it to his commanding officer just like he was told to do. The commanding officer, he rips it open and it reads this. 
He says, I want you, this is David, your king. I want you to put Uriah on the front lines where the fighting is the fiercest. And I want you to withdraw the troops from him. David has Uriah murdered. Just like that. And after that, Bathsheba moves into the palace with David. She becomes his wife. And you're left thinking, how in the world did all this happen? What a wreck. And you think it can't get any worse than that, but it does because then you continue to read the story of, of David and you find out that one of David's sons by the name of Amnon, he rapes his half-sister Tamar. Tamar is so distraught naturally by what happened she tells Absalom, Absalom is so enraged that his brother would do this that he seeks revenge on Amnon for two years. And after two years, he kills Amnon. The whole, the whole country splits in two and divides into a civil war. And it all ends with David killing Absalom. And the country is divided and the whole thing is in pieces and it's shattered. That's David's life. You might think, how did it fall apart? How did it get away from him? Well, if you go back and look at David's life, you can start to see where things fell apart. It doesn't happen often, but occasionally you'll be watching the news and you'll, you'll hear or read the news and you'll read about a report of a plane that went down. And it's really disturbing to see these photographs and these images of these planes going down. And then uh, uh, some official will get a, on the, the TV or whatever. He'll say, hey, now we're right in the process right now of looking for the black box. Everybody know what the black box is? The black box is this indestructible. And I'm thinking, if this black box is indestructible, then why isn't the whole plane made out of the black box? Can I get an amen? They made it out just out of that stuff. We would be dealing with this. But anyway, they're looking for the black box because the black box tells the history of that plane. It tells, hey, here's what went wrong in this wreck. Here's what went wrong in this accident. And guess what? They can discover what went wrong, but they can all discover what went wrong so we could prevent it from happening again. And that's what we're going to do in the kind of a sense is we're going to recover the black box of David's life. You have this dramatic moment, this this rape of Bathsheba, the murdering of Uriah, you have this cover-up, you have the rape of Tamar and the death of two sons, and now a nation is torn in two, and you're thinking, how in the world did all this happen? Many times I'll talk to a, a couple. I'll talk to a man. They'll tell me a story of a plane crash. The affair is discovered. The credit card bills that she thought she could hide got discovered. They're separated. And I'll ask him, what went wrong? And the husband will say, I don't know. Came home and all of her clothes were gone. They, she was gone. I don't know what happened. The wife will say, he never came home. I, I just don't know. Many times they just don't know. They, they, they don't get it. And what I want to do is look at David's life and and see where things started falling apart. In 2 Samuel chapter number 6, there's a scene that I think can help us see what would happen. And I believe that if this scene would have played out differently in David's life, then the moments of his life and the moments of his family's life maybe would have turned out a whole lot differently. In 2 Samuel chapter number 6, David is married to his first wife. Her name is Michael. And at the very beginning of their marriage, it's very romantic. David is a teenager. He brings his brothers lunch one day. They're in the army. He brings them lunch to feed them. He discovers this giant who's mocking the army of God. And David says, not on my watch. And he says, I will fight that giant Goliath. And in doing so, anybody who would step up and say, hey, I'll fight Goliath, Saul gives them two rewards. Number one is you're going to be tax exempt for life. Amen. And number two, Saul says, if you fight Goliath and win, I will give you my daughter's hand in marriage and David said I'll do it so he defeats Goliath and he marries Princess Michael and they have this romantic beginning David wins her heart over he's a good-looking man and athletic and, and and all this stuff and he's and she just loves him by the time you get to second Samuel chapter 6 things are going pretty good for David he's now been moved God of supernaturally appoints him to be king over Israel and he's in a good situation and a highlight for the nation of Israel is this when David brings in the Ark of the Covenant and he ushers it into Jerusalem and 
all of the entire country is celebrating that event. David is so, is so moved by this that he starts dancing before the Lord and he removes his royal robe. And man, he's just so thrilled to be dancing for the glory of God because of this magnanimous moment, man. It's just incredible. And he's just overwhelmed with emotion by it all. And Michael sees the, everything that's going on from a window. She can see what's happening. And the more she watches, the madder she gets. She's mad because there's other women watching the king, her husband, behave in this way, in a way she's embarrassed because he's, he's dancing in front of these girls. And she starts to resent him. And here's what happens when you get to verse 20. When David returned home to bless his household, in other words, he comes home, he got a smile on his face, he's excited, he's happy, wants to see his wife, he's in a good mood. The Bible says Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him, and here's what she says to him right out of the gate. She says, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants, as any, watch this, as any vulgar fellow would do. So he comes home, it's been a great day of celebration, and the first thing his wife says to him is, oh, look at you, king, out there partying up, dancing, and your boxers in front of all these girls. You big snake. I just can already see this argument. You are such a, you are a scoundrel, dude. I just can imagine the argument. I can imagine the things that were said. So this gets said to David. David's not going to sit there and take it. He's going to fire right back. And that's what he does in verse 21. David says to Michael, It was before the Lord, watch this now, who chose me rather than your father or anyone else in your family. He starts attacking her family, which is, of course is a, great, is a great strategy in marital conflict is to attack your spouse's family. That's always good. He chose me rather than your father or anyone else from your house when... He appointed me ruler over the Lord's, Lord's people, Israel, and I will celebrate before the Lord. And it's really a, a beautiful moment. He's, David is dancing not to impress the girls. He's dancing because, man, he's just so captivated by the Lord's presence and God being there. But that's not how Michael saw it. And the story really ends by telling us that Michael had no children to the day of her death. In other words, they never slept together anymore. And that's, a, that's the last year of Michael. It's really not mentioned again. And you say, okay, what, what, what happened? Why, why does the Bible tell us what seems to be a, an argument between a husband and a wife? And I don't know all the answers, but I'm thinking, if things would have gone differently in this moment, I believe things would have gone differently in a lot of other moments in David's life and in his marriage. I mean, think about it. What if David would have included Michael in the celebration? Instead of just going by himself, I mean, she probably wanted to celebrate too. What if Michael would have been encouraging to him when he walked in? It was a great day for him. What if David would have just sat down and listened to his wife and tried to see things from her perspective? What if there wasn't sarcasm as soon as he walked in? What if all the critical comments would have been changed to pr praiseful comments? What if there wouldn't have been no personal attacks? What if David would have been more understanding about how she felt? What if Michael wouldn't have been so insecure and defensive? What if somebody would have said, I'm sorry? What if somebody would have said, would you please forgive me? What if David would have fought for his wife while he fought for Goliath? What would have happened then? I think, just me thinking, I think things might have been differently and I think it might have changed the story. But we don't look at it like that, the way we look at situations like this. We tend to notice the one big moment when everything falls apart. But there's little things that lead up to that one big moment. A few months, a couple months ago, we had a really, really bad storm. Michelle and I were upstairs, and man, the wind was just blowing, and whoo, just blowing. And man, I was like, man, alive, it's really windy out, it's crazy. And, I get up next morning and go in the kitchen. Michelle gets up and, and I'm looking back there and I see this tree that had just been blown over. And I said, babe, man, that wind was so strong it blew over that tree. I went down there to look at the tree and I could see the wind didn't blow over that tree. That tree's been falling for a long time. Because when you looked inside that tree, you could see it had just been decayed and was just eaten up. All that wind was just simply just knocked over. 
Can I tell you that's exactly how it is in a lot of marriages? All we see is the big crash. All we see is the big boom and like, man, the world, how'd that happen? One author describes it this way. He says, when we get married, we give our spouse some kind of burden to carry. And I, what I brought with me today was I brought a, a, a rock to kind of illustrate this burden. And, 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 we, and we give our, our, our spouse this burden. And our spouse takes this burden and, and they love us. And they say, I'm going to carry it. Maybe it's the burden of passivity and your husband is just kind of passive and unengaged and not involved in the marriage or the life. And he's just kind of off in la-la land, never really present when, you're, when he's even there. And you say, I'll carry it. I've got the strength and determination to carry it. Or maybe your husband has a hot temper and he just loses it. And you as the wife say, you know what? I'm going to deal with it. I'm strong enough. I can handle it. Maybe it's the burden of addiction. It's heavy. You're going to do everything you can to love him. Maybe it's uh, the burden of, of just criticism and, and nagging and complaining all the time. And, but, man, you, you have this determination. I'm going I'm to carry this because I'm a mentally strong enough to do it. But can I tell you, I've been a pastor for 18 years. I've been married for 32. And I've seen a lot of friends say, I can carry it. I can handle it. But I tell you, after a while, this thing gets so heavy that it absolutely becomes overwhelming emotionally, physically, spiritually, and mentally. That if this burden is not lifted somehow, it eventually gets dropped. It's not something that was just, I'm not going to drop it, by the way, if you guys were expecting that. <laughs> but it didn't happen overnight. You've been carrying it for a long time. We ask our families, we say, hey, uh, we, don't, we don't ask him, but we kind of infer just with our actions, I want you to carry this burden for me. And we hand it to him. My wife, hey, hey, wife, carry this, this anger that I've got. Carry this hot temper that I've got. And you say, and you justify by saying, it's my wife, she can handle it. The wife says, carry these, my out of control spending. Just, you carry that burden. You know what? And my, he's my husband. You know, my, my husband will, he's done it for a long time. He can, he can, he'll handle it. Kids will be fine. They're used to us arguing and complaining in front of each other. Kids are resilient. They'll be good. Teenager, out of control, rebellion. They're my parents. They'll deal with it. I'll be fine. They're just, just, you know, it's just the way it is. And after a while, you do the best you can. I'm not saying you don't. You don't give up on day one. I mean, you carry it for years and years and years. But I'm telling you right now, and after a while, it just gets too heavy. And what ends up happening, even if they don't leave, you end up living in a hollow marriage. You live in this hollow life. And you think you have the, the strength and vitality and, 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 and personality or charisma to be able to just will it out of them or let, no, no, no. What is happening is it gets so heavy that you can't do it no more. So you disengage and you go away or you just drop it all together. It's like, what happened? Here's what I like for you to do right now. I want you to do a, a self-evaluation. And I want you to ask yourself this question. What rocks or what burdens have I asked my family to carry? And I know our tendency is to say, well, look at all the burden I'm carrying. No, no, this ain't for, like that. This ain't that kind of. I want you to do a self-evaluation where you say, what, what, about, what am I putting on other people that? And after a while, they're just like, man, I can't do it. What, what is it? Can, can I tell you, if something doesn't change, if the burden isn't lightened, it's going to come crashing. I'm just telling you. Mark my words. If, it, it's, just, it's just what happens. 
If God, if God doesn't get a hold of your heart, and change your heart towards your wife, change your heart towards your husband, change your attitude towards each other, guess what? It, it crashes. It, and many of you are shaking your heads because you know it's true. Because you've seen it happen. And I believe in this story that we just read about David that there's really some, you can learn what not to do just by watching somebody's life and their, how they live their life and Examine the black box of how they live their life day in and day out so we can learn about what not to do and, and how to handle situations so we can lessen the burden upon those we love the most. How, how we don't have to live in this kind of turmoil and chaos. How, how the walls of our home can tell a different story than what they're always told. I just want to give these to you real quick. Is that okay? Is everybody, is everybody okay? Everybody take a deep breath. Everybody do, on the count of three, take a deep breath. One, two, three. <sighs> All right. Didn't that feel good? Amen. I'm just going to give you, I'm just going to give you like three or four, three or four helpful hints that'll help us just kind of ease the burden whenever conflict happens. Number one is this, identify what the issue is. And I know it's hard to identify what the issue is just in the heat of the moment, but take time to identify why are we even at odds with each other? What's going on here? Michael, Michael she just lays right into David as soon as he, he comes home. And of course, David is just laying blasted. He get, becomes immediately defensive. And I don't know, maybe the real issue is, maybe Michael wanted to be there with him. Maybe she wanted to celebrate with him. She sees David dancing around, and maybe it makes her just feel a little bit insecure, and she just needed to be affirmed in that moment. But when you identify what the real issue is, you can deal with it. Because it's on the table. You can see it. You can see it from her perspective. She can see it from your perspective. You guys can... See how you're going to deal with it in the future. Number two, find a time and a place to talk. And something I've learned in my marriage, and I've said this before in other sermons, but something I've learned in my marriage is please don't have a difficult conversation whenever you're tired or hungry. Because when you're tired or hungry, it's, Michelle and I have had our best heated discussions, arguments, fights, you know, knock down drag out. Guess what? We've had those whenever we're tired or hungry. Here's what I'll tell you to do. Get a nap and get a Big Mac and then have that conversation. Amen. Because I'm telling you right now, you will feel a whole lot better once you get up. That situation, it'll look entirely different when you get up in the morning. It, it will. It just will. You get something in your belly, you're going to be able to focus a whole lot better than the way that you're focusing now. You can say, hey, let's, and, and I don't know, but for Michael just to lay into David when he got home, that wasn't the right time or the right place, but David, on the other hand, he should have had the maturity to say, hey, let's just calm down. Let's set aside the emotions. Let's set aside the defensiveness. So we can deal with this. Maybe right now isn't the right time to talk, but we do need a time to talk. Otherwise, it builds a wall. If you keep on building that wall and you don't deal with it, guess what? You can't see each other. So let's just deal with it. Number three, stick to the issue. Did you notice what David did? He expanded the issue. He's, he doesn't attack the problem. He starts attacking her family. And can I just tell you something about that? It's easy to expand the issue. Who can't expand the issue? You can always go down a hundred different rabbit trails, but you are in a disagreement right now for one reason. Just find out why you're in that disagreement because if you don't, you'll end up going on a thousand different directions and you'll never deal with it. You'll end up talking about something that happened 15 years ago. And guess what? You won't deal with the issue that's on, that's on the table right now. And the problem just lingers and nothing ever gets solved. And let me also say this, when you have a disagreement in, in your marriage or a conflict in your marriage, and can I just tell y'all something? I'll say it again. We all have different disagreements. Nobody has a perfect marriage. You're not a stick. Everybody's been, you've been raised one way. She's been raised another way. Two people come together, they're going to see life a little bit differently. It's just the way it is and you're going to see things a little bit different. There's got to be some understanding with that. But when you do have a disagreement, my advice is this, never attack the person, attack the problem. When you start making personal attacks on somebody, it just goes downhill. Feelings get hurt and it just, just doesn't work. Lastly, very last thing is this, set things right between you. Romans 12, 17 says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you as honorable and do your part to live at peace with everyone. It's pretty good advice, isn't it? 
pretty good advice. Romans 14 also says, don't get into fights and arguments over disputable matters. Have, have you ever been in a fight, heated discussion? Have you ever been in an argument with, you know, with your wife maybe, and, and you get up the next day and you don't even know what you was arguing about? You're just like, why were you so mad at each other anyway? Because you wanted to eat at Chick-fil-A and I wanted to go to McDonald's? What was that all about? I mean, what, why, are we, why are we mad at each other? Has that ever happened to anybody besides me? Amen. Somebody just raise up their hand and make me feel good. Amen. All right. It's just what needs to happen. And when you set things right between you, I, I would encourage you to um, just don't just like, just boom, just bulldoze somebody. Don't be a tank. I'd encourage you to start off with a compliment. You know when Jesus writes to the first seven churches in the book of Revelation, he, five, five of the seven of those churches, he gives a compliment. He affirms them. You know why? Because he's trying to say, you guys are doing some right things here. You, you're doing some good things, but here's what I hold against you. And, and that's what I would tell you to do. I mean, Michael obviously didn't like David dancing without her there and that sort of thing. But she didn't have to just land last night. She could have said, hey, David, I knew you was a good singer, but I didn't know you could dance like that, brother. <laughs> you got some dance moves. <laughs> you know, just kind of give him a compliment. Give her a compliment. Because here's what I know about David in this moment. When he comes home, he wants his wife to be proud of him. And every guy does. I'm, I'm just being honest with you, ladies. Your guy that you're married to, the guys I know, they just want their wives to be proud of them. They want their wives to be happy. Amen, fellas? They, they really do. But when he gets home and she's sarcastic and she's, and she's critical and, and he's had this incredible, momentous day and it's just like, oh, it just sucks the wind right out of the sails and some of you know what it's like. Proverbs 21, 19 says this, it's better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and nagging wife. I didn't write it. Don't, don't look at me that way. But you know what the Bible is saying? The Bible is saying, if your wife just likes to fight, and you can say anything and it just sets her off, and it just, just instigates and starts these sarcastic and critical comments towards you, the Bible says it's better for you to just pack up your bags and go live in the desert and try to make it on your own. Every husband wants to please their wife. I, Every husband I know wants to please their wife. Amen, fellas? Ladies, can I give you a little piece of advice without you get mad at me? Here, here's the piece of advice. Here it is. Brag, don't nag. Brag, don't nag. Say that with me. I'm just kidding. You don't have to say it with that. But if you affirm, if you compliment your husband, when you, man, you know he's, I guarantee you, man, he, he, he's working hard. Try and do the best he can. He's not going to do everything right. He'll make mistakes. He will. But he, but he wants you proud of him. He wants you happy. He really does. Let me say a word or two to the fellas. Fellas, everybody ready? Sitting on the edge of your seats. You ready? Here we go. As men as the fathers, the Bible is very clear about this. We are called by God, by the word of God, to be the spiritual leaders of the home. And there's no doubt about that. We are called to, to step into that role. When we don't, of course, the ladies have to. In fact, I can give you many verses to cite this. 1 Peter 3, 7 is a very significant verse. It says, in the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat her with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, weaker physically, but she is your Watch this, equal partner in God's gift of new life. Now watch this, if you do not treat her as you should, your prayers will not be heard. They don't even get through the ceiling. Can I tell you something, fellas? You honor God by honoring your wife. You honor God by honoring your wife. Men are called to love your wife in service and sacrifice with humility and gentleness. And I believe... As you read the Bible, it's very clear that, Bible, that the Bible calls the men to be the spiritual leaders of the home, but I also believe that the Bible calls the women to be the spiritual encouragers of the home. Just not all on the guys. 
But women are called to be those spiritual encouragers. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Christ loved the church by doing what? By reconciling the church to himself. Jesus is the reconciler. He's the one that pursued you. He's the one that tried to make things right with you. So what's he saying by this? He's saying it's on you men to be the reconciler, to be the one to try to patch things up, to be the ones to pursue, to be the ones to try to make things right. You say, well, I didn't start it. I didn't do it. Wrong answer. That's not the right answer, guys. You're the, Christ pursued you. Christ reconciled with you, and he calls us to do that with our wives. Can I get an amen? I have a question for you. What if David would have taken that approach? What if David would have tried to reconcile with Michael? What if he would have said, you know what? I know we're dealing with some things right now. But here's something I know. I love you. You love me. We both love God. We're going to get through this. We're going to get through this. You and I are going to go to Cheddar's and talk. We're going to get a babysitter. We're going to, but, we're going to, but we're going to get this worked out. You think things would have been a little bit different. But what happens whenever you get stubborn? What happens when you get selfish? What happens? The walls of your house could talk. Maybe they would tell a story of conflict and brokenness and anger and disappointment and hurtful words and bitterness. Have you ever thought that maybe it's time for the walls of your house to tell a different story? Have you ever thought, man, God would love for our homes to be, and our marriages and our relationships and our lives to be places that tell a story of his love and his grace and his mercy? God would love it if your home would tell a story of his redeeming power. God would love it. Nothing more than for, his, than for our homes to tell a story of his healing hand. And can I tell you all something? The beautiful news, the good news is this, it can. You know, you know how it can? It's when you release those broken pieces to God and you say, God, I've tried to do it on my own. All I've done is make a mess of this. God, I surrender it all to you. I turn these broken pieces so you can put them back together or because some of you didn't have a kind of a, a good model growing up. Our God says, I will put it together the way that it's supposed to be together in the first place. Can I tell you who eventually does that is David. You say, what do you mean David did that? Well, David looks at his life and, and he sees how he's hurt and broken the heart of God. He sees how he's broken that relationship with God. He sees the people that he has devastated and the lives that he has ruined. And he is overwhelmed with emotion. And the Bible tells us about a, a prayer that he prays in repentance to restore his life. And here's what he prays. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from all of my sin. Have you ever prayed that prayer? Have you ever prayed that prayer? Can I tell you, pride doesn't pray that prayer. He goes on in verse 10 and says, Create in me a pure heart, O God. Can I tell you, every prayer, really in everybody's life, but I'm gonna talk to the guys Every prayer for a guy ought to be, create in me a pure heart, oh God. If you're a married man, you ought to pray this prayer, God, only give me desires for my wife. God, create in me a pure heart, oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me, I love this, the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. God hears his prayer, he sees his heart, and he restores him. But I want to also say this. David lost a lot. You look at David's life after the affair with Bathsheba, and it's like the peak on a roof. It goes straight down. It just does. It 
And you can't, David couldn't go back and hit rewind and do things over again. But man, God is so good. That God uses David's story and all of his bad decisions, and he uses it for his glory. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, when you get to the first book of the New Testament, remember there's been 400 years of absence. Everybody's expecting this Messiah to come. And when you finally get to Matthew chapter one and verse one, everybody's waiting this big announcement. It's a big moment. How is the Messiah? How is this person gonna be introduced? And here's, what, here's how Jesus is introduced in Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. A record of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Only God could do that. Yeah, but David did all this. His family was a wreck. Everything fell apart. And look what God did. And look what he did. That's God's great. And, and there's some of you here today who think, man, God can't restore. God can't reconcile. God. God can do anything. Our God is a God of miracles. If God did it for David, let me make it more personal. If God did it for me, if God did it for my marriage, he can do it for you. He can, he can bring you closer together. But here's where it all starts. It starts with you saying, hey, God, I need you to be the center of my life. I'm going to ask everybody just to bow your head and close your eyes. Father, we love you. And God, I just pray right now that you would do for us what you did for David. Would you just... Take the broken pieces of our life, gods, and put them back together the way that you want them together so that your will can be done in our each individual lives, but also in each of our marriages so we can have marriages to honor and glorify you. Father, you are the creator of marriage. And you ordained it to be a beautiful union between a husband and a wife, and God, I pray that, that our homes and our marriages would, would resemble that. Now, I know nobody's perfect, God, but, but Father, that's our goal. And maybe you're a husband here today and, and as you kind of look at the mirror of your life, you would, you would be perfectly honest. You'd say, man, I've got some work to do. If you'd be honest, you'd say, you know what? I haven't stepped up to the plate the way that I needed to. I know God is calling me to, to another level of commitment to, to him first and foremost, but also to my wife. And maybe you're a, a wife or, and you're just worn out got so much on you it's just hard to be positive in those kind of things and that kind of environment where everybody just comes at you a hundred different directions and you just say God I just I just need your spirit to lead me every single day give me wisdom give me clarity God help me to see things the way that you want me to see things because so many times we want to point fingers and play the blame game and but right now God we come to you in humility just saying God I need you in my life now more than ever and if you're here today, friend, if you don't know Christ is your Lord and Savior, as I said earlier, that's where it all starts. When you say, God, I, I surrender my whole life to you. Can I tell you, my friend, God can take the pen of your life and start writing a whole new chapter whenever you surrender. And I just want to give you an opportunity just in the quietness of this moment just to do that. The Bible says the wages of our sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ your Lord. I'm telling you, my friend, you surrender, truly surrender your life to Christ, your life is never the same. Maybe you drifted away from God. And you just, God says, man, you need to come, you need to come back home. Come back home through repentance, just like David. Come back home through repentance and surrender. God restores the joy of his salvation into your life. That's what he does. That's what he'll do. What I want to do is just lead you in a prayer of repentance and salvation right here and right now. And just invite you. If you've never been saved, you've never been transformed by the power of God, if you drifted away from God, you just need to make a decision of recommitment. right here and right now to save my eternal soul. I, 
I receive this gift. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. I, I receive it right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Just with every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to count the three. I hit three. If you said that prayer, I want you to lift up your hand high so I can see it because I want to pray for you, friend. The enemy is going to say, don't, don't raise up your hand. I'm telling you, raise up your hand. I hit three. Raise up your hand. One, Jesus Christ, I'm just so much you died for you. Two, he's very close again. Three, raise up your hand all over the place. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Raise it up real high. You said that prayer. God bless you. Amen. Amen. I see five, six hands go up. God bless you. today. Church, can we all stand our feet? Father, we love you. God, we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you, God, for telling us the good news that's out there, but also tell us the not-so-good news, the real stories of people's lives, the real mistakes that people made, but also the ramifications of, of your redeeming power and your, your incredible grace. God, I pray that we receive it today. I pray that the walls of Thank you.